2 Timothy chapter 3. It is Mother's Day 2018. Happy Mother's Day, mothers. And mothers to be, in case you're, you watch this recording, we have two mothers to be. One's mama already, second coming along. And then um, a first time mama to be. Always exciting time as well. First Timothy, or Second Timothy chapter 3, you know, to me there's a lot of significance in order and numbers. And Second Timothy, you know, many times we talk about being the last book that Paul, our apostle, wrote. Uh, that became scripture. And therefore just has that much more meaning. Second Timothy, now this is chapter 3, not chapter 4, but Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All, and underline that word all, because all means all. all, it always has, it always will. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And I, I kind of start with this right here, that the man of God may be perfect. You know, the Lord's intent is that every man of God, that everyone be perfect. And it starts with Scripture. All Scripture is given for these things in the middle there, that the man of God may be perfect. Well, let's put this in full context here. Let's back up to verse 10. Of course, this, when it says, but thou, this is literally Paul talking to Timothy. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, not the doctrine, not scripture, my doctrine, Paul's doctrine, Romans to Philemon. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. Let's just stop there right for a second. Come back to Acts chapter 13. Keep your hand here and just come back to Acts 13 and 14. Well, actually, so 13 and 14, at the beginning of 14, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went together in the synagogue of the Jews. Uh, let's come ahead uh, to chapter 16 now. So this is not long thereafter. Acts chapter 16, verse 1, Then came he, being Paul, to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman. So on and on. And this is where Paul and, and Timothy um, begin their journey together. So come back now to 2 Timothy chapter 3, where we were just reading in chapter 11. So persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. And, and think about that in light of the conversation that was started before the study. But the end of verse 11, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Verse 16 Again now, at the end, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. So we have the man of God in verse 16 and 17. The passages before, you know, verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Well, let's even back up further then in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. Because it, it seems like chapter 3 is we, we've got two groups of men here. We've got the evil men that'll and seducers over here. 
we've got the man of God being perfect over here. These two in contrast one to the other. Chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Think about Janus and Jambres standing with Moses. Of course, that's back when Moses first goes to Pharaoh, and he first says, let my, you know, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. And they need signs back then. And so what does he do? He throws his rod down, it becomes a snake. Janus and Jambres, what do they do? Throw their rods down. They become snakes. Wow, they've got serious power as well. Perhaps as much power as Moses, as much power as the God of Moses. Well, the next verse helps us unfold that the God of Moses had more power, I'll just say, than the God of Janus and Jambres, the evidence thereof being that Moses' snake eats the other snakes that were the rods of Janus and Jambres, and then it becomes his rod again, of course. The point being, these signs that were created back then, Paul says, hey, the signs will come again in the future. I mean, how will the Antichrist gain the power that he has? It'll be through signs and wonders. Satan is, has been granted power as well. And for that matter, there are healings that go on in this day and age in the dispensation of grace in some of these third world nations. You know, I hear some of these um, missionaries um, associated you know, with the, the, the signs movement. You know, just get all excited about raising people from the dead and, and these healings and those. He and, you know, I don't know what all goes on and doesn't. I, you know, I know these guys come back talking about it. Uh, and I know stories like this that Satan's got plenty of power. The God of non-believers uh, has a lot of power. And, and those things happen. Let's come back to the context here. Okay, so verse 8, Janus and Jabberies withstood Moses. All right, so we came down to the end of verse 9. Then verse 10, but thou. So now we're shifting from these evil men, uh, these men in verse 5 that had a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof from such turn away. And then we're, these men are compared to Janus and Jambres. We're told about these men in verse 7 that they're ever learning but never able to come unto the knowledge of the truth. These are things describing these men. And Paul is warning about the times to come as in the times that we live in today. Now verse 10, after talking about those things he's warning Timothy, now he comes and addresses Timothy in verse 10. But thou, Timothy... Thou hast fully known my doctrine. Once again, not just the scriptures, my doctrine specifically, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, and obviously I'm adding in here to make the points, my long-suffering, my charity, my patience, my persecutions and my afflictions, which came unto me, Paul, at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, all of those being Acts 13, 14, up to 16, where he meets Timothy. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Never forget that. 
It's right there in Scripture. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers, seducers. Think about that word, evil men and seducers. Something that looks really attractive, they're using it to seduce people and to beguile, exactly. Trickery, craftiness, shall wax worse and worse. And there's that word deceiving going right with it. And being deceived. Deceived, to cause people to believe something is true when in fact it's false. Or to believe people, or to lead people to believe something is false when in fact it is actually true. That is deception. Uh, into verse 13, deceiving and being deceived. Now here's my verses, 14 and 15. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And on and on it goes. Uh, Kim and I had some guests from Denver this, uh, this week, and it was great the discussions we had about context and specifically as it relates to scriptures and how the scriptures, so many things that we think are um, uh, contradictions in the Bible. If you go to context, the, you know, Google Miles Coverdale context, print it out. I usually, it may be in this Bible, but it's fallen apart so bad I don't want to hunt through it right now. But it, it's something like this. It shall greatly help thee to understand the scriptures if thou consider Consider us what comes before, what comes after, you know, what was written of whom, or, you know, by whom, to whom. Um, so, who's writing it? To whom are they writing? Get the whole context. Verses 14 and 15, that context is everything that came before, everything that comes after, the man of God being perfect at the end, the evil men that are seduce, the evil men and seducers are before this, and it's the scriptures in the middle, and the reason I'm going here today, it's Mother's Day, it's Timothy's mother that in here, that from a child, um, verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Wow, just think about that. Come back to chapter 1 in this chapter. Chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, context. Paul, to whom? To Timothy. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee, Timothy, in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Now watch verses 5 and 6 on Mama's Day. Verse 5, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and somewhere... I'm wondering why your father's not even mentioned here. It is strictly your grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, 
nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our, of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And obviously there's so many different directions we can go um, with everything we're reading here this morning. It's Mama's Day, and I just I wanted to really talk a lot about mothers, and as we see here, grandmothers. There is no greater occupation in the world. There is no more, more important occupation in the world than the role of mothers. And I would say, as Paul is making very clear in the last book that he wrote, once again, find that amazing. Not really. The last book Paul wrote has that much more meaning and significance because it's the last book he wrote. And the fact that he would point out by name Timothy's mother and grandmother. So you think about the roles that mothers and grandmothers have in raising up the perfect man of God. Go ahead, uh, Mike. <laughs> uh, out of this group. Uh, last week we went over about the aged women teaching the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, and the word of God, that the word of God may be uh, not blasphemed. So, uh, in, in Titus. Uh, but anyway, we talked about that. Beautiful. The women teaching the younger. Yep. And because we're on Mama's Day this week too, let's go read that. Titus chapter 2. That is the next part. And thank you for doing that. You were just making sure you were going there. that the word was getting out there that uh, everybody... So in Titus chapter 2, Starting in verse 3. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior... So let's start in verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Let the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise. And it's, it didn't just say women likewise. And verse 2 wasn't men. It was aged men. Verse 3 is the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. What be not blasphemed? The Word of God. The only thing that really matters in life today is the Word of God and what it teaches us. And of course, the main thing that really matters today is either a person is saved or they're not. Either there's a day, you know, there's a day of salvation, we're told in Paul's writings. It's the day that we trust in the Gospel of Christ. How that, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, this is how we're saved today, the gospel of Christ. How that, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he hung on that cross, he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised again the third day for our justification, all of that according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. There is a day that we believe, you know, there's, we realize that we've been just trying to be good enough and, and counting on the fact that, you know, 
you know, I'm not as bad as that person and that person. I do know that person over there is probably better than I am, more righteous than I am. But I try to be good. I try to, to treat my fellow man right. And I try not to do these wrong things. I know they're wrong. And a few times that, you know, maybe I stray a little bit. Well, you know, I know that Christ died for sins of the world. So, but I try to be good enough and, and try to do this. And for that matter, I ask the Lord to forgive me for that. And, you know, if I died tonight, where would I, you know, it's, it, it's how do we answer the question? If you die tonight, where would you go and why would you go there? Mothers, there's the first, the most important thing to teach your children. Grandmothers, it's probably the most important thing to teach your children first and to the extent that we are granted permission by the parents, um, our grandchildren. But it is their family and it's that that mama and papa that are commanded by the word to have rule of that roost. The point being here, the gospel of Christ is all that matter. There is a day that when we realize, oh my goodness, I never would have said I'm saved by works, but what am I trusting in? The fact that I'm trying to do the right things and trying not to do the wrong things. For all have sinned, Romans 3, or Romans 6, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, that's not Romans 6, 23. That is Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen to that, 6, 23. Okay, and there's a day we realize that's what I've been trusting in, I haven't been trusting in the gospel of Christ alone. Therefore, I have been perverting the gospel of Christ, Galatians 1. Today, I'm getting saved. Today, I'm based on the fact I now am trusting in that gospel and that gospel alone. I'm going to stop trying to be good enough and just start trusting that either what he did on that cross was good enough. I mean, for crying out loud, he abolished death on that cross. He was raised from the dead because he, took our, he, he became sin. That's why he died. Our sins were placed on him, in him. He became sin, but he shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins. Took those, you know, went to hell. Spent three days in death, in hell. But on the third day, God the Father raised him for our justification, abolishing death knowing that we all can be raised from the dead in the future. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. For the dead in, at this event right here, the dead in Christ, those that have died already, those mothers that are dead right now have died already with the testimony of salvation. We know that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Not just mothers, everybody. For the last 2,000 years. And then we which are alive and remain, if it happens while we're still here, walk in the earth, shall meet them. That, who's them? Context, the dead in Christ that rose first. We shall meet them in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord in the air. Amen to that. Amen to that. All right, so that is the, the, the most important part of what we're reading about here in Titus chapter 2 and the sound doctrine and teaching the next generation, and it's all based upon what's in this book right here. I think back also, interestingly enough, you know what, I'm not even going to go there right now because we had a, a conversation going on here. Instead of going, it's going to go back to Genesis. Let's just go back to where we're talking right now. You know, discussion about prayer and today. So let's go to Philippians, the book of Philippians written by Paul. <laughs> A great passage talking about prayer. Chapter 4. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not where I want to go. Yes, it is. Chapter 4. Matter of fact, it's interesting in chapter 3. Uh, verse 3. Chapter, Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with 
other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Paul goes out of his way to mention, Romans 16, how many times does he mention women by name that helped him in his ministry? Women have huge roles. Okay? Now, yes, 1 Timothy tells us women are not to usurp authority over men. They're not to teach men as in Bible studies. They absolutely are to teach the children and other women. Aged women, you're absolutely instructed to teach not your, just your daughters, younger women. And he didn't isolate that to daughters. It said, teach the younger women. And what we just read in Titus chapter 2 there. Think about that. So there's absolutely a role for women teaching Bible studies, teaching scriptures, but, not just, they're, but they are commanded not to teach men. Okay, men are to teach men. And the point being here, Paul goes out of his way many times to mention women by name. Where I'm really going here anyway is verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Why? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Prayer, and that was the discussion before. Why should we... So the question being posed, why should we pray today if we know the outcome, there is kind of an assumption in the statement, but that what we pray may not actually impact the outcome, as in if someone has cancer. Okay, does my, can my prayer heal that person? So first of all, let's start with, no, your prayer won't heal the cancer. Should we pray for that person? Absolutely. Should we pray for the physicians attending to that person? Absolutely. Some people do come through. Many people do come through cancer. Many people do come through events that you never think they have a chance of coming through. Is it because of your prayer? Maybe not. Could your prayer have an impact on it? Absolutely. Could your prayer that the Lord work through those physicians to, just so they're on the top of their game when they're in front of, if it's your child, if it's in front of your friend, we always pray for the, the physicians, I think, first and foremost, as much as anything. Lord, help them be top of their game. Help them to, that, to, that extra 1% to, to influence something they discover or how they're treating this. Okay? Absolutely. It's no different than a ball player. You know, he's out there, you know, a professional ball player. He's playing a game, whatever sport it is, every game, but some games... You know, he's just got that extra effort he can make, that extra 1%, and he just comes through that gain. Okay, same thing with that doctor. So that's part A we can pray for. The second thing is um, we pray for the Lord's will. You know, how many times do we say, you know, not our will, but thy will be done? What is the Lord's will? How many times do we hear it say, sometimes the Lord answers our prayer by not answering our prayer the way we asked, made that prayer? right? And we find out a year or two later the greater glory that was received because the Lord did not answer it the way according to our will, but according to His will. Okay, so a lot of black babble. What does all that mean more specifically? How about, is there a person, a door of utterance, is there some other person that's part of this whole circle of, an, of a situation, a person has cancer. Well, there's going to be a lot of friends that will be coming in and out of that hospital room that will be praying for that person. There will be doors of utterance. And so the Lord's will, it would be that all men would be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Through that situation, would somebody else hear the gospel of Christ? And, you know, we've talked not long ago about Brother Moore when he was in that terrible accident. And the nurse at the hospital there, you know, Brother Moore, for a long time, nobody, you know, they, they thought he was going to die. Because of that situation, he has an opportunity to preach the gospel to anybody and everybody that comes through that room. You know, brother, for those of you that ever met Brother Moore, um, 
But a nurse absolutely got saved. We have every reason to believe absolutely got saved during that time. And she heard the gospel because he's in that room. And as he said so many times, I'm not telling you that God caused that tire to blow out on our van so that I would get hurt and so that I would be in that room and so that that nurse would be attending to me so that she would hear the gospel of Christ so that she would be saved. Actually, this was two weeks ago. Time and chance we were talking about. Okay, but no, those situations are used so coming back to our prayer, and, and thankfully we're even told, um, and think about the verse, that we know not what we ought to pray for, but we pray anyway, and the Lord Jesus Christ is our intercessor between us and God the Father, and He takes what we pray and says it a better way. Hey, what Jerry really is praying about God the Father is this, as that intercessor in the middle, is what we're told. And uh, the Holy Spirit, exactly. And, and this is what she really needs, um, is the peace of God, as in verse 7 there. Okay, because we're praying, so another th part of this discussion, because we're praying uh, in everything, by verse 6, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Good, bad, whatever requests, let them be known unto God. Verse 7, and the peace, I have it underlined here, the three words, peace of God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts. And, and the second, there's the last word that I have underlined. Four, four words I have underlined in verse 7. Peace of God and minds. He shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Back to another part of the question. Can Satan, you know, enter thoughts into our minds? Okay? You leave yourself open, put yourself in situations that, you know, Satan can absolutely have a conduit to, your, to our minds if we let him. As in, if we're watching movies we probably ought not to watch, that's absolutely a conduit for Satan to enter into our minds. Um... What's the word I'm looking for? Through that channel. So not literally, but more than figuratively. So, so he's not literally in our minds, but can he cause thoughts to come to us through those channels? Absolutely. That's his door. That's his door of utterance. Thank you. Excellent. It's a great analogy. And are there you know, things we can put in our bodies that might make our minds more open to, to that? Okay? So the wrong movies with wrong things in our body that just give, give a door of utterance to the wrong message. Okay, that, I guess that's what I would say. But thank God that verse 7, thank God literally, that verses 6 and 7 are here. Because of our prayers and our requests that we're making known unto God and mamas, one skill, skill if that's the word, one activity to teach and reinforce with our Children is prayer, is prayer. Yeah. I remember Kim had a book, the effect. Uh, no, that's a verse, the effectual fervent prayer, but um, the power of prayer for mothers or something like that. Of wives and mothers. Wives and mothers. You know, okay. And it was it was a great book, and actually there was a version of that book for men and fathers and husbands as well. Okay, but the point is teaching that to our children. Okay, how key that is. But the peace of God is part of that. You know, what's the reward for praying and praying always and praying for all, making all your requests be made known unto God? You get the peace of God. Okay? Okay, thank you. So, and, and let's actually go there. Romans 8. I'm going 4 4, so. I <laughs> know it's not. Romans 8, team preaching today. <laughs> there are many parts to the body. Okay, um, uh, so Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth, I have that word underlined, helpeth, our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, 
but the Spirit, capital S, itself, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to, I have those two words underlined, according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose. Wow, man, goosebumps right there. Thank you. God, thanks for bringing that into the study. Okay, great verses right there. Great verses. But so praying and getting the peace of God, conditioning our minds. Okay, we know we have the Spirit intercessing for us um, in this whole process. So, coming back to the way the question was posed, does it get answered the way we want? Many times, no. Sometimes, yes. Many times, not the way we want. But was it according to the will of God? The very last phrase of verse 27? Absolutely. Not just most of the time. I would say every time. And that's what sets up my favorite verse in the Bible, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. All things, including a lady getting cancer that's a best friend of ours. And it hurts. Absolutely hurts. But it's amazing, as in the study two weeks ago, time and chance and the circumstances about. And when guys like Barry Hampton die in their sleep, okay, even though people... A matter of fact, it, another, which we haven't gotten that study, the cost of the father. The other one is the study that Barry preached that Wednesday night. He was hurting. He was hurting bad. Barry was here in Texas two weeks before he passed. And he told, Jerry, he told Dr. Watson, we were just talk, talking about him on the way up here. We've got to go see him. He called yesterday. His wife is, we talked about him last weekend. And but that's when I met Barry. It was when he was in Texas two weeks before he passed. Oh, really? I'm not sure. I ever, you probably told me that, and I'm not sure I knew that. I met him in Nashville a week later at our national sales conference. He was there with another group. Wow. At the really? yeah, you couldn't violent. write a better I script. Know, right? Man, you're just bringing tears to my eyes right now. I mean, man, oh, man. So, so Barry was here in, in Texas two weeks before he passed. And when he met with Dr. Watson, I met Dr. Watson because Barry Hampton is the one that really set me up for that interview. That's what moved us here to Austin back in 2006 um, when, I, when Dr. Watson hired me. But anyway, Barry Hampton is the one that literally put my name in front of Dr. Watson for that position. My point is, so he was coming through Texas. He was in Dallas and he and he taught a Bible class up there and talked with Brad Davis. Part of it was, think back now to 2009 and 10, when the Internet's just getting, not just getting going, but Barry was the first one of the Grace Preachers to get studies on the Internet. He said, hey guys, this is the future. We've got to, you know, if we're not there, the rest will. And of course, the big churches were going there. But there weren't any Grace Preachers there yet. Barry was the first. And so he came to see Brad Davis about audiovisual equipment and what is the best. And if I really want a, a TV quality broadcast, Barry went live on, on TV. And uh, plus put studies on the internet. He was on a local channel there. Um, uh, so he saw Dr. Watson passing. So from Dallas to go down to uh, Austin down to New Braunfels to preach at Jerry Lockhart's church. He stopped in Austin, met with Dr. Watson. He told Dr. Watson, he said, I'm, I'm, this is probably the last time we'll see each other. I'm, I, I don't have much time left on this earth. I'm, I'm going to be dying soon. Barry knew he was dying, is the point of all this. At 51, he knew he was dying. And, and so he was battling some pretty serious um, illnesses, heart conditions. Okay, he had almost died a couple, maybe six months prior. Wow, I'm going so many, but what really, <laughs> what got him going and at the same time, which contributed to a more rapid death, was the glory of his ministry, which was January of that. Barry died September 30th, 2010. January 2010 
is when Barry got a door of utterance in, in uh, Franklin, Kentucky, uh, to some Amish people. And he'd been going there for two years. And finally they said, you know, Barry, we know you're a preacher. What is it you believe? And he said, thank you. Get the men together. Amish community, it will be the men first. Get the men together. Give me three hours. Four hours would be better. Next time I come, and everybody come with your Bibles. And oh, by the way, it'd be a whole lot better if you'd all get King James Bibles for this study. And Barry brought a bunch of King James Bibles with him also when he did come back the next time. And it's just like Acts whatever channel uh, chapter uh, where Paul preached through the night and one guy even falls off the windowsill, right? Um, Barry preached his four hours and they said, keep going, brother. Keep going. This makes sense to some of them. And he preached almost all night long. And because they, they were so eager with what they were seeing. Man, yeah, me too. <laughs> what they were seeing in the scriptures. And several of those men got saved. And our dear brethren in the Lord today, they'll be in Baton Rouge. And they're at the Chattanooga Conference. And it's just... So, Barry got on fire. I was working pretty closely with Barry at the time. Every single Sunday, Barry would preach Sunday more, you know, Sundays um, in Montgomery. He'd jump in the car, and I want to say it was about an eight-hour drive, maybe seven if you really hoofed it, from there up to Franklin, Franklin Kentucky. Front Sunday night study there in Franklin, Kentucky at different homes of those Amish individuals and Mennonite individuals. For them to come out of the bondage, you know, Amish and Mennonites are very works-based religions. And they just, they saw grace. They saw grace. People got saved, many people. It was just, and Barry got so on fire for that. That was absolutely his purpose in life for that year. Many people said, Barry, you got to slow down a little bit. Those people said, Barry, you got, we, we want you preaching to us. He said, hey, you know, as the Lord wills, I'll, I'll keep coming as long as he wills. Barry came here, so probably early September, and maybe it was late August, but anyway, not long before he passed. If you can even have a way of knowing, that'd be great. We'll figure it out. Um, but he told Dr. Watson on the way down. I remember, I can't remember if we watched together or if I watched, I may have watched it as a recording, but Barry went down to Jerry's church on Sunday, and I still think, I, no, they weren't live. Or were they live years ago out in New Brumfels? That's where I thought I met him. And could it have possibly been earlier than August? I guess it could have been. Yes. I don't know for sure the relation to that to when he came through Texas. And then my thought is, is that it was live because wasn't uh, Dick still doing anything? Dick was doing the audio. Video. It was live. Yeah. And I remember watching. And I thought, oh my, you know, again, knowing that Barry thought he was, just had months to live. He, he did call, he called. Matter of fact, a lot of the uh, uh, studies in Kentucky we watched live. They broadcast those live. He came through the Woodlands too and we went to dinner with him. Mm-hmm. He brought Tommy Bahama shirts. That, and that was 2006 <laughs> actually, yes. Tommy Bahama. Yes. So, so that was in the 2006 time frame when we still lived there. So here's my point of this. We watched Barry from Jerry's church. And I thought, oh my gosh, Barry, you're coming clean of all your sins. I mean, at first I thought he was doing it for effect, but then he had me believe in uh, what he was saying. And I thought, oh my gosh, Barry, what are you doing? And, 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 and I'll just, so I'm not leaving you hanging here. You know, it was, for Christ died for our sins. Not, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm an adulterer. I have committed adultery on my wife. And he's going on and on. And I mean, the way he's going, you'd think he was confessing literally. I mean, I literally thought he was literally conf It is. Sin is sin in the Lord's eyes. And if I'm guilty of one all shucks, I'm guilty of adultery. I'm guilty, I'm a murderer. I've murdered. I murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and you didn't get to that part till the end. But I've, I, I'm guilty of murder. 
because as we're told um, in Galatians, as we're told in James, this sin is the same as that sin. And until we actually can see that, we are no different than the adulterer. We are no different than the murderer, literally. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and sin is sin in the Lord's eyes. We're all guilty of homosexuality. You know, whatever your worst sin in your mind is that you can conceive, you're guilty of that. You're guilty of that. My head, I had a point of where I was going with all this. So Barry Hampton, the literal night that he died, um, I don't, I think I saw it, I did see it live, but I've seen a recording of it, and, and I think that's when we ought to get also, Kim. The night that he died, because he preached a great message, normal study like this, and the next day he was leaving, I don't even, he was leaving to go to Jamie's house, his daughter's house. And he was very excited about it. As a matter of fact, they were leaving Bible study Wednesday night to go home and bake the, the cake. And he even talked about the whole recipe in the study. <laughs> but then at the end, he broke down crying. I pray, uh, this is all about prayer. That's why I'm going here. Pray for me, gang. I'm hurting. It hurts. And he meant literally. His body ached. And he just broke down right there at that pulpit in front of everybody. And my point of all of that is, pray for everything. So back to Philippians 4, so I'm grabbing the exact words. <clears throat> you know, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Be careful for nothing. Yes, all of those things. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lo I'm, not, I'm in the wrong... Philippians 4, 6. Yes, 4, 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. So we're, we're praying for everything. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding. And actually it goes back to Romans 8. It's the will of God the Father that comes through all the circumstances. And that's really what we... I ha okay, now I, I, I'm going to make a statement. Obviously, I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling that no matter what words I pray, when the, the Spirit intercedes in the middle, what's getting to God the Father is, and my servant Steve is asking for your will be done in this situation that he's praying for. And my servant Jerry is praying for your will, Lord, be done in this hospital room where my friend is. And by the way, would you give me peace, the peace of God to, to get through this? You know, it, it's never easy getting through the death of a friend. And, you know, we're in, we're in the flesh. We're in the flesh. I think of people in the room that have, have lost children. I mean, I, you know, what great, what tougher situation to go through. Okay? As Janie has shared with us so many times, knowing the testimony of her son, that's what allows her to have joy in the situation. She knows, you know, the outcome. We think about mothers um, that are no longer with, you know, families in this room. Okay, you can have joy when you know the testimony of that. Um, you know, I, I joy in the fact that, you know, my mother-in-law was sitting right next to me um, the night she got saved, the, the exact time she got saved. I mean, I, I glory in that. I, I have no problem. I go right back to all the words in, that she stated and what she was trusting in for her salvation. I was sitting there. I heard the message that she had just heard. So, so you can glory in situations like that. Um, so Barry, and just going back to that whole situation, I think about the will of God and the just the number of... Um, revivals that happened all over the country as a result of the death of Barry Hampton. Okay, I wouldn't, nobody wishes a death on anybody. But we glory in all things work together for God, for, and for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. And when it's His purpose we're praying for, all things work together for good. And the death of Barry Hampton, that whole revival up there in Kentucky 
and that whole community up there in a place that would not hear the gospel. They gave him a door of utterance. He pounced on it. Yeah, it probably contributed to his death. It just happened sooner rather than later because guess what? So far, for 6,000 years, everybody's died. Unless they're walking this earth right now, everybody has their moment of death, whether it's 51, 61, 91. Some might even make it till 101. Some it's nine, like his son. And the message that Barry preached as a result of the time and chance of Barry being in the car when he lost his son. And, and the people I've heard him be able to witness to about that, um, you know, personally sitting across the table to help either people that were in a situation that needed comfort or people that just, wow, Barry, you mentioned that over here, you know, about being in business for yourself and Jonathan coming and saying, Dad, you have the coolest job. You're here with me all day long. You know, everybody else's um, parents, dads have to, you know, go to work all day long. And, you know, Barry using that story and then getting a door of utterance to share the gospel with people. And you say, wow, how cool. Anyway, that's my whole point of, of all of that. And coming back to mothers and teaching, you know, A, praying for your children, our children, the next generation, raising them. You know, I, I would have gone to Proverbs and a couple passages there. Train up, a tri uh, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Okay? Mothers, there you go. I mean, that's, it, it doesn't get much better than that, you know. It, um, no matter where that child is, no matter what age they are, they're still your child. I don't know what age it is where they shall not depart from it. I, I do believe there's a reason the story of the prodigal son is in the Bible. And I'm sure that there was a mama praying fervently for that young man that became that um, prodigal son. Uh, the whole family rejoiced when he came back, when he returned from his departure. Okay, never give up hope. It would be the point. Pray, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Worry about nothing. Pray for everything. Be thankful for anything. Those are the, the three things that would go along with that passage um, right there. Uh, peace of God in verse 7. Probably the best verse we could end with. Uh, so, so Philippians... 4, 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, would be Romans chapter 5, and grabbing the two verses before it, Romans four twenty four. but for us also to whom, so it is righteousness, shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, Romans 5, 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Mamas, never stop preaching the gospel of Christ to your children and helping them understand the peace of God that they will have being justified by faith, and I would say in context, without the deeds of the law. It is trusting, not trying, trusting in the gospel of Christ. How that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for being here. Thanks, mamas, for all you do, have done, grandmamas, the roles you play. And mamas to be, we are excited for you as well. Uh, that was good. Yeah, and then good. there's the thought shall be established. <laughs> and because we're not off tape yet, that was a good thing. Uh, <laughs> Proverbs chapter 16. <laughs>
is a great one also to bring right into that. Uh, Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Okay, starting in verse 1. The preparations of the heart and man, and the answer of the tongue, is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked, for the day of evil. Interesting. Uh, But verse 3, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Great one to bring into that study, George. Thank you. Mike, thanks again for filling in last week. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like to read another verse if we're done. Oh, Absolutely. Hey, Kim, hold on. Hey, Kim, Kim, just pull out up there on the camera. Just pull out the cord that's plugged in front or pull it out. Um, so, yeah, follow that one up, the one that's on the side of the camera. Just pull it out of there. That's going to transfer it from my mic to the mic on the camera. The one on the left, on your left now. No, no, yeah, your left. There you go. Perfect. That's all. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Second Kings, chapter 20. Bear with me. Second <laughs> Kings, what? Chapter 20. Yep. Uh, just these first 11 verses dealing with Hezekiah his illness. Uh, Verse 1, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amoz, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, and this He's, and this is so key. He is sick unto death. And the Lord says, yes, yeah, set your house on your own die. And what does he do? He prays right here in verse 2. Uh, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. Hezekiah wept sore, and it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out to the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days... 15 years and I will deliver thee and the city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend the city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake and Isaiah said take a lump of figs and they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered and Hezekiah said unto Isaiah what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up into house of the Lord the third day and Isaiah said the son shall thou have of the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or go back ten degrees and Hezekiah answered it is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees nay but let the shadow return backward backward ten degrees and Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord and he brought the shadow Ten degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Anyway, there's a lot in there. Yeah. But it's very clear 
that this guy was going to die. Mm-hmm. That is the outcome. And he prayed, and the Lord healed him and added 15 years to his life. I know different things for different dispensations and all that. I understand. But this is the same God that is sovereign, that we know, that we love, Amen. that we belong to. Mm-hmm. This is the same God that has all power, that can do all things. I mean, he's sovereign. If he chooses to heal somebody, he can. And will. Right. So, anyway. Go back and read that. Like, yeah. You know? Anyway. Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I got a little light on that. The prayer is not for you, it's for them that they may open the door to the Lord and say, Pray for me. Uh, one day I, I was going on my way to Dallas and uh, Lane was in the hospital in Georgetown because he had his knee operated. So I stopped by to visit him. We were talking, I said, well, I gotta go, you know. He said, well, you know what, I'm in pain, I'm in a lot of pain, he said, and I need prayer. He said, will you pray with me? I said, yeah. So we prayed. And about 10 minutes after we prayed, he said, you know what, the pain is gone. I said, really? He said, yeah. Isn't that amazing? I said, well, it sure is. (laughs) 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 So, had a, a, a reprieve from the pain. And, and it wasn't for me, you know, but I think it was more because he asked for it. Mm-hmm. And so we prayed together, so there's something there, you know. Two or more. Mm-hmm. I think the prayer is to prick the man of the person's heart. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry? The prayer is to prick the person's oh. heart. Yeah. Who's mm-hmm. ever sick. Exactly. There are so many things we don't know that happen and don't happen as a result of our prayer. I think of, you know, our daughter in San Antonio and and her husband, uh, our son-in-law, have uh, been uh, many career opportunities being presented unto them. I mean, just in the last, every week it's a different and all all good. But Kim's, you know, Galaxy's like, what should we do? Have you prayed about it? You know, first thing Kim always says to her, have you prayed about it? Have you prayed together about it? Um, And then... The next day, another part of it comes, you know, another door opens or another door closes, and it's just, it's been amazing. And, you know, Kim always wants to, I think, I'm just using it as an example because it, I, I witnessed all this, but, you know, firsthand, it's a great example of teaching your children by bringing it back to the prayer. See? Did you pray about it? Yeah, okay. And see what happened next day. See? You know, thank the Lord now, you know, and, and Make sure you're praying thanks for these doors opening and doors closing and keep praying for his will. And, and it'll come. And, and so that's that's been great the last couple of weeks watching all that. And I think my personal opinion is it's the best opportunity for their family, the way it's all unfolded, which is different than what they really thought was their will at the time. They wanted to get back to Houston. But um, anyway, so enough of that. But so we pray for God's will is the end of the day. We get peace of mind. We get our minds. But like Pete said also, praying for a door of utterance to the individual, especially if, if we think they're not saved, or if we have a question as to whether they're saved or not, we're praying for that door of utterance for somebody to preach the gospel to them, and that it would be at a time when their ears are open or not open. That's probably the biggest thing right there. Yeah. It can be a perfect stranger sometimes because yes. I remember at the beach when Jerry talking with you and you talked about your mom and, and I said something and you, and you said it wouldn't be me. Pray for a stranger yeah. Oh, yeah. that she comes across, you know, that can deliver it, the message. It's funny that you say that because when that went on, I... <laughs> <laughs> Y'all got a little insider information no, there. That, you uh, keep it to yourself. It's, <laughs> it's lights that pop in your head. Of course, yeah. it's going to be somebody besides us. Yeah. Of course it is. But you know, up until that moment, it was like, well, I want to tell her. I want to tell her. I want, yeah, I want it to be me. I, want yeah. to yeah. I don't want to be that one necessarily, but. You know, it's important that she knows, and, and, and I know to tell her, and you know, so let's go. We and believe it now. <laughs> yeah, believe it now. 